Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're here again to talk about the Flames playing whatever sport it is they played this week for most of the week. Um, Before we get into it, just wanted to let everyone know that we just want to apologize. We have a correction. We were supposed to have some game previews of all these games out this week, and we didn't get that out due to a technical issue. We'll let you guys know when we're able to deliver those game previews, so stay tuned. But Matt, let's jump right into this week, shall we? Well, you know, it reminded me of some playoff hockey. You know, unfortunately, we didn't know that it was going to be very reminiscent of the Avalanche series from two years ago. I was going to say playoff hockey because we can't win four of seven? Uh, No, because we got (laughs) our rear ends handed to us severely every game. (laughs) Well, let's look at the first game here, and, and the score sheet would tell us differently, but in the game on the 15th, Goudreau scored an OT to get the Flames a 4-3 OT win over uh, the Vancouver Canucks in Vancouver. This one, I don't think that the I don't think that the scoreboard. I mean, the Flames win and they get the the two points, but I think that the Flames winning this one was maybe not the story of the game. What do you think here? Yeah, uh, they this team like uh, that, especially the at the end where they had control of the game. And give up a shorthanded goal uh, with the Vancouver having their net empty to tie it up. Like you couldn't just hang on for the one minute sloppy execution. Like, yeah, and it's just a lack of focus and energy from the team entirely, and it was evident in each of the games that were played this week. I think in this game specifically we were lucky to get the two, we were lucky to get it to overtime. I mean, you know, I think sneaking away with one point in this one we would have been happy, but you know, that that overtime goal, I, I think we're lucky to skate away with two points. Yeah, and like if you look at the the Flames got down two nothing early with two power play goals against, which I can't fault uh Markstrom for that, but you know, once again, the Flames are starting off a game, playing lousy, getting themselves in trouble, getting themselves down, and then they have to fight like hell to get back to equilibrium. And to their credit, Milan Lucic, Elias Lindholm, and Dylan Dubé scored in quick succession at, right before the end of the first period and then two in the second to give the Flames the lead. But... Then they took their foot off the gas, and Besser ties it and sends it to overtime. And, like, the Flames seem to be beating themselves more often than not. And, like, it's hard enough to win games in the NHL period because even the worst teams can beat you on any given night. But when you're also doing really dumb things like not starting games on time, getting blown out in the first periods of each game, being down to nothing every game, like yeah, you're not going to win very many games. You're not going to be successful. Flames are like beating that. themselves. Yeah, like it, as much as like credit goes to Vancouver and Edmonton this week for getting seven out of eight points off of us. It, uh, more than uh, that goes to Calgary for just playing uh, that badly where they just gave Edmonton and Vancouver those points. On the next game as well, Calgary gave Vancouver some points. This was the game on the 17th here in Calgary at the Saddle Dome where the Flames once again wore the blasty jerseys. And this was a very different score. Instead of the Flames winning overtime, the Flames ended up losing 5-1 to the Vancouver Canucks. Brock Besser got two goals and two assists to help the Canucks beat the Flames in this one. And again, I think this is another game where what I got out of this was the Flames were beating themselves and I thought the Flames were trying too hard to do something that they did nothing. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Yeah, this was the first game that Markstrom played poorly as a Flame. I agree. And I think he just was frustrated by Vancouver and angry at them and very sloppy and like the it was bad enough the one nothing goal but the two nothing goal to Bo, Bo Horvat it's like why are you leaving the crease like that when there's no reason to 
like you literally just gave him the goal for no reason and it's like that's just mind-boggling to me and then the flames do their typical thing when they're down to nothing they fight hard for the remainder of the second period andrew mangiapane gets a goal within a goal it, it, things are looking good for the third period and then they just stop playing and within a minute the canucks have scored two more here you are trying to get back into the game play effectively be a good team and try to get those two points and then oh we're actually in striking distance let's stop playing and game over like it's just it's the same crap basically that we've seen pretty much every year with this group where it there's just no intensity focus determination heart anything well as you mentioned markstrom didn't look good in this game and he only played 47 47 david reddick played uh 12 13 after uh markstrom got pulled but matt i thought like you said this was the first game that they didn't play well i think this really shows who this team is without a good goalie behind them like uh, you know there's been goal games that you and i have talked about it we've been saved by reddick reddick has kept our butt in there and maybe made us look better than we are i think this is the game that really shows what this team would look like with any other goaltender net well, frankly, if um, the Flames had the starting tandem from last season with Talbot and Riddick, uh, I think that the Flames would be hovering right around with Ottawa at the bottom of the league. Yep. And probably behind Ottawa, wow. frankly, with how they played. Yeah, I saw and a lot more defensive like lapses it, in this one just because the goalie wasn't there. Yeah. And... Like, this team has been bailed out uh, significantly by Markstrom. And, like, the fact that they're even alive right now is a testament to his stellar play. And, like, frankly, the guy deserves a Vesna trophy even if the Flames miss the playoffs. That's how bad the team in front of him is. He's earning his $6 million this and, year. Yeah, he's the only one, really. Well, we, we got through that game. I think we were all frustrated after that game and thought, you know what, the Oilers, we can do something with them. And uh, Friday night, the Oilers were here at the Dome and ended up beating the Flames 2-1. to uh, Mike Smith in net made 20 saves in his fourth win since his season debut earlier this month. Um, the only Flames goal here from Rasmus Anderson. And I thought that 2-1, to one, I thought, in this one was generous for the Flames. I thought that, again, there was just no spark. There was no get up and go the flames just looked like they were going through the motions for a lot of this game uh this was a game where it was quite evident that none of the actual skaters on the team gave a damn the third period you're down by one and you manage five shots and no really good scoring chances through you know when you're pushing for an equalizer and you can't even string passes together or like any it, it's edmonton like, give me a break. It's the Oilers. They're the one of the worst teams in the league defensively. You should be able to skate around them like they're a bunch of pylons because they're bad. I agree. And yet, you know, that's what you get. And they look like pylons in those orange jerseys. Yeah. And it's just... Like, this team seem It really reminds me of, like, the when the flames were in the rebuild mode and like the last like 15 20 games of the season when like before they even had guys like monahan where the team was just dead <laughs> on the ice and like it was let's play random people to see what they have for next year and like it was those that's how this game and the next one both seemed like nobody had any actual intensity or desire to do anything it's just show up to the rink play the game and get the, the hell best out. analogy i heard this week is the effort level of this game reminded somebody of the father-son christmas game they play with their kids uh peewee team yeah and honestly i think that the kids would try harder than that kids know they're gonna beat their old dads most of the dads can barely skate but, yeah, I mean, it was just – it did not look like a, an NHL team that cared, an NHL team that was predicted to be in the top two in the North in the North Division. This was a very different Flames team, and they, they deserve the loss here. And honestly, I mean, I think, again, testament to our goaltenders. Um, in this one, we had 
uh, David Riddick in net, but I think the Flames probably should have lost by more than two to one. Oh, it could have, if not for Riddick, that like this should have been more of a four or five one game, and you know, good on Riddick for coming in. He looked really good, and he with Riddick, I have nothing but positive things to say. He's showing that like he still has that ability in him which come postseason time if the flames actually do manage to find how to play actually right now hockey, if is looking like a big if yeah if then you know having a reliable go- goalie in david riddick to be a backup in the postseason would be a, a huge boon for the team but yeah uh, it, unless something's drastic happens in the next week or so or two yeah i think we're gonna start looking more at uh who's the you know the guys in the top 10 in the draft and start getting an eye on those type of players now we can always start watching the stock knee play oh wait they won they lost 7-1 tonight as well but Yay, um, Calgary. Well, let's move on to the next game. <laughs> and, and I think the only other note here is, um, and we'll talk more about this in the next game as well, but Sean Monaghan out of this Oilers game due to a lower body injury. He was listed as day-to-day. And he was also out for the next game, the game that I think will focus most of the show around. Um, Monaghan out. Glenn Godden makes his NHL de- debut. Just to read out the lines on this one so people know how the team rejiggered things. Uh, first line was Matthew Kachuk, Michael Backlund, and Andrew Mangiapane. Second line, Johnny Goudreau, Elias Lindholm, Josh Levo. Third line, Milan Lucic, Sam Bennett, and Dylan Dubé. Third line, Joachim Nordstrom, Glenn Godden, who wore 42, and Buddy Robinson. So a very different look for the Flames and obviously didn't do them any favors because they ended up losing 7-1 to one against the Oilers. I'll say that again, 7-1 to one loss against the Oilers in this one. Um, I don't know that it's... I think that there's some positives to take away in this one. I thought the Flames actually looked good offensively in this game for the most part. They got a lot of shots on. They were getting some good shots on. I thought that Koskinen played his heart out in this one, but we, we were giving up way too much space in front of the net, and, I mean, part of this was just McDavid doing magical McDavid things. But as soon as we passed the center line into our own zone, I saw the Flames broke down in most cases. Yeah, it's it was just the clear lack of any cohesion defensively in this game. And, um, yeah, it's, it is what it is. Uh, you know, like... This just was a team that didn't show up to play at either end of the ice. Like It's really hard to find any positives as a Flames fan. The Oilers came out, took the Flames behind the woodshed, and had their way with them. Like, it, you know, uh, it's it was a pathetic effort. And with 44, again, I'll yeah. give credit to Costco, with 44 shots on, you should probably get more than one goal. Yeah, and... It, as you said, it, credit to Koskinen. Like, even the goal that he gave up, he was interfered with by Kachuk. That, again, wasn't Kachuk's fault because he was pushed into Koskinen. But, you know, like, it, it could have easily been a shutout if not for that one play. And, like, this team just had no answer at all for anything. I don't think the Flames should have won by any stretch of the imagination, but I think that no. from what we saw, 7-1 didn't tell the story on either side of this game. I don't think the Oilers played all that hot either. I think this was really McDavid doing his thing, and I mean, we saw a goal from you know Chase on and uh, and what was Josh Archibald, but otherwise I think you know the Oilers did not play that well as a, as a unit either. No, and like this team just well you, you know like this uh leads to something that we've discussed in the past and like how i've mentioned that like oh this team is one of the best teams in the NHL on ta- in terms of talent on paper this that and the next thing and you know um uh, back before we even did the podcast and i think it was 2008 2009 um the flames uh played a game against the Chicago Blackhawks and they went up 5 nothing and then lost that game. 
<laughs> in uh, regulation. I vaguely I remember that. And then the next night they were in Columbus and they got shut out. And Columbus at the time was a deadbeat team. And it, at that point, like I on Calgary Puck, I had made a rather lengthy rant <laughs> about like that this team like is, it, there's something fundamentally broken about this team and that like basically as the team was that was as good as they're gonna get and that the Flames should look at retooling because if you're not showing the right response to you know like really after blowing a 5 nothing lead they should have tarred the, the Blue Jackets and probably won like 6 or 7 to nothing and yet they came out played like crap and got shut out and when I'm seeing this team uh, I could easily write the same story. Like, the, this team is fundamentally broken I would right agree. Now. Let's get back to that. Let's just take and, a look at where we are in the week, and then we'll come back to that if that works for you, Matt. Yeah. yeah. Uh, after now 18 games of our 56-game season, the Flames have eight wins, nine losses, one overtime loss, so essentially eight and ten for 17 points tied with Vancouver. That puts us fifth in the Scotia North Division. Uh, only Vancouver at 17 and Ottawa at nine are behind us. That puts Montreal with 20 points, Winnipeg with 21 points, Edmonton with 24 points, and Toronto with 30 points ahead of us. So, I mean, for two weeks now, we've been on the outside looking in, and this is dangerous. And I think, as you were saying, we can write the story this year of the Flames looking very similar to what which is on uh, in 08 09. But the question's been asked all week, and I want to know your thoughts is the sky falling? Like, is it is it time to finally do something big? Whether that's getting rid of a GM, whether it's getting rid of a player. Well, you know, um, myself, like, it's been widely reported about um, that, that players only meeting that the Flames had a couple weeks ago where a bunch of the players met, talked to Matthew Kachuk and basically told him to knock it off with his antics. And for me, um, that Kachuk is the type of player that you win Stanley Cups with. He's like Brad Marchand or insert, you know, all the countless that type of guy with championship cal- caliber teams. So, you have a bunch of players that underperform all the time telling the one guy that's actually doing things right to not do that. If it was me and I was the general manager, I would be working diligently to find the names of every player that said anything to Kachuk and make sure that they reside on another team as soon as effing possible. And it wouldn't matter who the hell it is. Gaudreau, Monaghan, Giordano, Backlund, wouldn't matter. Get the hell out. You have that loser attitude, go play for some other loser team. You know, we're we're committed to actually winning and giving a Here in this team, you know, Kachuk gives a Guys like Dylan Dubé and Andrew Mangiapane give a It's one of those things that there seems to be a group of players that are content to just pad stats, basically, and content with the lackadaisical effort. And, yeah. uh, And that's one of the reasons why I firmly believe that, like, based off of talent, that this team is always seeming to be underperforming the actual level of raw talent. And, like, that's why I always base my evaluations on is just the raw talent, because personalities and all that are the secondary effect on the standings and, like, the drive of the individuals. And that's where I think we're running into the conflict is that, you know, and, like, since that meeting, Kachuk and, like, the the type of players that he have in common on the team have all been playing significantly less intense and basically not playing themselves. And it's not either. like Kachuk and is playing a different style. It's not like Dylan Dubé all of a sudden decided to go out and be a grinder. Like Kachuk is playing or was playing before that the way Kachuk plays, and that's why he was drafted to play that way. Like we knew what we were getting in Matthew Kachuk when we brought him in. So it's almost like saying to Johnny Goudreau, Johnny, 
you know, go out there, get, you know, gain two inches and 40 pounds, start hitting guys. Like, you are who you are. You play the way you do. And I think the other guys, instead of telling them to knock it off, really have to maybe figure out how they can support that. Or I don't want to say work around it because it makes it sound like it's a bad thing. But how do you let Maddie do what Maddie does? Because that's why Maddie's here. Yeah. And, it, you know, like, uh, in a lot of ways, like, uh, hockey is a battle. And you need to be able to trust that the person on the ice with you will have your back. And basically what Kachuk was told is that we don't have your back. And stop Allegedly. doing Allegedly. Yes. Allegedly. And, like, I can understand why Kachuk has not played well at all in the last couple of weeks. Because, you know, you're, you're dumping your heart and soul into this. For a bunch of players that don't seem you're, to care. You, you remember in school when you had that group project and you were the only guy that was trying to do anything and the rest of the group would show up 20 minutes late to the meetings and sit there and talk about their dates and slough off and expect you to get them the A? That sort of seems like this whole team right now. Yeah. And there's like six guys that actually seem to care. Uh, Rasmus Anderson, Andrew Majapani, um, Milan Lucic, Dylan Dubé, Matthew Kachuk, and Yusuf Valimaki and the goaltenders. So, you know, like, the rest of the team, not really. Uh, you know, uh, varying degrees of passiveness. And, you know, like, a guy, like say a guy like Sean Monaghan is a very common passive-ish person just as a person. So to expect that intensity from him is kind of, you know, but you can have guys like that. It's just when they're trying to take away like one of the good things that this team is doing well talking about changes that need to be made and you and i have been talking since last season even before that of is it time to move goudreau and we talked about this earlier in the month we actually got an email from a fan named petro um petro i apologize we didn't read this earlier it got stuck in our spam filter so we'll read it today and it sort of goes with this discussion as well uh why are we talking about trading goudreau who by the way is the player that scored the most po- points so far what do you think we can get for him? Surely not an equal in good points producer for the same cap hit. A less productive player and a pick or two? Who's going to score points while the picks develop into our top six players if they do? Don't you think the problem here is the management of the team? We ended up with an average at best coach and a bottom line cap of $10 million, Lucic, Ryan, plus whoever. So let's break this down a little bit. Um, and I think this goes to the same sort of discussion we're having. We won't, we won't fantasy trade Goudreau. We've done some of that. But why are we talking about Goudreau? I would say I'm talking about Goudreau here because, yes, he's getting the most points, but that also makes him the most valuable asset if you got to move something. Yeah. And to be fair to him specifically, he has seemed like he cares. He has. But I, but I, this but I don't think you can just judge him on this season either. Like He's looking good this season, no. but how often in the past have we said he needs to be better? Yeah, and that that's the thing. And, you know, and with it, every trade, you have to give to get. Exactly. And, like, you look at the hamilton uh, Furland trade. Like, at the time, oh, uh, quite a number of Flames fans were upset that, oh, you traded this good young defenseman and Michael Furland, who Flames fans still remember highly of from the Vancouver series. And and a good prospect for two guys from Carolina who whose stats are unremarkable. Like, why did you do that? Those two players have become key members of this organization. But, you know, like, you have to give to get. And, I, like, I think that there are plenty of opportunities around the NHL, and thankfully there are 30 other teams, to be able to find some fits that you'll be getting decent or better players back while giving you know and it would be unfortunate to see a guy like Gaudreau or Monaghan traded but you're also gonna you know it's not gonna be like uh the, say like the Joe Thornton trade where you know a couple of eh players and that's well I think getting. even outside Joe Thornton you'll look at the Jerome McGinley trade here right Mm-hmm. And and yes, I mean, you know, Pietro says, what are we going to get back? A less, quote-unquote, productive player? Yeah, I mean, we may not get a guy who has the same numbers, but I also, he's saying, who's going to score um, if we, you know, while well, that guy's developing? Well, Kachuk, Lindholm, you know, like, 
Mondiapani. Mondiapani. Dubé. There, there should be enough. Monaghan. There should be enough guys that can take that on. And I just think that, you know, when you're in a slump, nobody wants your stuff, right? If it's not working here, why is it going to work there? So I think that, yes, Johnny Goudreau is looking great this year, and I don't deny that, but his body of work is a flame. You can't just look at what's right in front of you. His body of work is a flame to me. tells me he's not the most productive guy here, and why not sell while the, while the selling's hot? Yeah, exactly, and because his contract is reasonable, like teams mm-hmm. would be more likely to want him because he can fit easier in cap structures and all that but like this team like calgary has plenty of teams that they can trade with whether it's trading a monahan or goudreau or giordano or 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 yeah like there's plenty of options and like this season's a bit awkward because of like the quarantine zones and all of that but I don't think this is the year you, know, you can like, blow up the team. Like I know you've talked about it, Matt, and I think that if they're going to blow it up, they got to wait till the off season when you can move guys around more easily and and more efficiently. Yeah, and um, yeah, and it's well put this way. I think like if a trade, more significant trade, were to happen, it would be sooner than later, just so that way that player can get through quarantine. Like, say, probably, like, by the next episode of a Fireside Chat, or maybe the one I can see that, one big trade made latest. to try and shake things up, but I can't see them trying to, quote-unquote, blow this team up this year. I can see them make one big move to try and turn things around, but you're not going to... I mean, to me, when I think of blowing things up, I'm thinking you're moving five players off your roster. Like, to me, that's a significant retooling of your team. That's not happening this season. We mm. might move... Pick any name you want: Goudreau, Monahan, Bennett, some guy, just to make a move and change the you know change things up. But I don't think you see more than one big move during the duration of this NHL season for the Flames. Yeah, and I think that unfortunately that that this with the COVID protocols that the Flames are basically stuck trying to figure things out on their own and which that makes life a lot more difficult, but um, we're definitely getting like the final verdict on the state of this particular iteration of the team, and uh, like to me, it, uh, I'd almost rather this team miss the playoffs for a couple seasons and like move out any of the parts that aren't working, and figure out through like draft picks etc etc like especially because like you look at uh like the last two first round picks that the flames have had well peltier and zari they both played that more gritty ish while offensively skilled type game in the the same mold as kachuk or dube or manjapani and so like that's where like this team is building towards so like this team really does need to sort out okay well if this is the direction we're going then we have to commit to that fully or start over and well i'm talking about the direction so one of the things that Petro here brings up is don't you think the problem here is the management of the team? We ended up with an average at best coach and a bottom line cap of $10 million, Lucic, Ryan, plus whoever with little space left. I'm going to go out, and I've said this before, I don't think management's the issue. I think the tree's putting the right guys in the ice. Tree's doing the best thing he can. I think that, you know what? Tree, while I agree that Jeff Ward is not a seasoned coach, everybody started somewhere. He's well regarded in the league. I don't know the seasoned coach is going to get anything better out of these guys. I don't think yeah, it's a coaching like, issue at this point. No. Uh, literally, the only thing that um, would make a difference would be um, like getting a coach that would kick some rear ends. Uh, sort of like what Peters did in his first season. Tortorella's already got a job, man. Coach. Well, Sutter's available. Sutter's retired. And, uh, Gallant's available. But even so, as we've talked you know, about in the past, changing coaches mid-season, now you're without a coach for at least two weeks. Like yeah. I, Again, I don't think you change coaches mid-season. Now, the question here is also asked about the bottom line costing $10 million plus. 
I don't think that we can put the Lucic uh, deal in there as a fair comparison because we traded Neil for Lucic, and I would rather have the Lucic deal than the Neil deal. So we tried to get out of a bad contract, and to do that, we had to inherit another contract. I should think that was a brilliant move by Tree to be able to pull off Neil for Lucic. Yeah. In my mind, the Flames have won that so, trade because James Neal is just that bad, and Lucic's contract ends sooner. So, so even though yes, it's a lot for the fourth line, I think that we made you know chicken salad out of chicken poop, and we were able to you know get something out of something that was bad, and and that the GM was in, was willing to admit that. How many GMs do we see that sign a bad deal and they keep that guy on their team because it's their guy and they don't want to admit mistakes? Good for Tree for realizing it was a mistake and moving on. As for Ryan, yeah, I think Ryan's a little bit expensive, but we're out of the deal this year. I don't think that having Ryan on the team is hindering us from making any deals. Like, yes, you're right, we have very little salary cap, but what do you want us to do with this cap that we couldn't do if we had Ryan? Yeah, exactly. Like, Derek Ryan at the time was a very necessary third-line center. And he's played up to his entire contract. Like, it's not like he's been an invisible force. I know he's been injured lately, but, you know, like, he's been full value for his contract. And, it, you know, like, yeah, it's expensive to spend $3 million on a fourth line center. But that's also part of why the Flames were like, on paper, one of the best teams in the league, because they had four good centers. And I agree that I probably wouldn't have paid him $3 million or I wouldn't have thought he was worth $3 million, but you know what? The deal's over at the end of this year, and do I think he'll get $3 million on his next deal? No. But, but I think that, like you said, it was necessary at the time to fill gaps, and that's what it took to fill that gap um, when we didn't have maybe young players ready to step in there. So, again, I think Tree has done what Tree needed to do to put the right players in the ice. So I don't think this is management's fault at all. No, and like if you look at... Like, I've heard other criticisms about, like, guys like Levo and Simon and Nordstrom and, you know, insert random fourth-line guys here. Well, the part of the problem is is that all the good prospects basically have graduated or are in college or in junior still. And, you know, like, this is one of those where you just kind of have to have a holding pattern of insert veteran guys here for a year or two. Uh, until guys like Peltier, Zari, um, and, you know, like all the kids, uh, Pedersen, et cetera, that are on the farm or elsewhere can get ready to be in the NHL. And it's just we're in that little temporary inter interstitial space where things are just not clicking and, on and that And for regard. filler players on your roster, I think that for the price we got them at, Josh Levo, Nordstrom, Simone, they were all great pickups. Again, maybe management is... I mean, management doesn't decide where they're playing on the ice. That's up to the coaching staff. And and I think that, you know, maybe Tree Living didn't expect, you know, Levo to be on a second line with Lindholm and Goudreau. But I think he, he filled the right spots with the budget he had. Like you said, these aren't long-term deals. If they work out great, it's almost like Toby Reader, right? He looked good. He was a fun player to have here for a year. We don't need you. Off you go. So, I again, I can't fault Tree for bringing any of those guys in. On paper, they were the right guys to bring on this roster. Yeah, and like he brought in uh, Brett Ritchie, and Ritchie's looked rather well in his time. And, it, you know, like even Glenn Godden looked good yesterday. He was one of the few players that didn't look terrible. So, you know, it's one of those you have to wait and see. And to me, in my mind... Um, the general manager's job is to get as much talent on the ice as possible under the salary cap and deal with whatever things seem to be lacking organizationally, like what's the most significant problem, let's deal with that, and so on and so on. And like last year, the most glaring weakness was the goaltending. Well, we got one of the best starters in the NHL now great it unfortunately one of the other problems came up of well this team has no heart <laughs> well that's kind of a you can't really deal with that until it becomes so glaringly obvious that it's smacks you in the face he's a smart guy and but he like, can't see the future 
No, and, like, that's part of the problem. Like, you can only react to... And, like, there were inklings that, like, this was a problem. Especially the underperformance. But, you know, like, you look at, say, like, last year against Dallas, the Flames were the better team in five of those six games, and the goaltending let them down in the sixth one. But the team... Like, they could have beat Dallas in that series. And if they had, they could have easily replaced them in the Stanley Cup Finals. But that didn't work out. And, you know, it, the most glaring problem in that series was the goaltending, because, you know, allowing bad goals at inopportune times kind of hurt. Just going back to the idea of, you know, management here on you know, being the issue. I don't know that we can fault tree for not bringing in a better coach. I mean, the flames have never really had a top flight coach since the eighties. And from what I've heard and what I know, it's ownership that doesn't want to pay that. So we can't fire the GM who's following what his boss said. He can't pay money. He's not given. So I think if anything, I mean, what are you going to say? We should sell this team so we can bring in Gerard Gallant. Like I, I don't, I agree with you, Matt. The heart and soul isn't there. The, these guys often look better, and somehow they don't come out the other end. We've gone through how many coaches. I'm not convinced it's a coaching issue, and I'm not convinced it's a management issue. It's the twenty. It's the twenty guys in the ice. No. Yeah, and like that's where, like it's one of those things. If you're having the same issue, basically, you're at you're in, you're out. Uh, like, even the year that they were really awesome and got 107 points. The last, like, two months of the season, they were playing basically like this. Where, very inconsistent, no heart, and then they entered the playoffs and got hammered by Colorado. And, you know, it, it's... Like, this team... it It's been the same problem. And... Like, now it's coming to a head because, frankly, the general manager has removed all of the other potential problems outside of that. And as you said, too, I mean, the GM has been great about bringing in what we need when we need it, right? As best he can. He can't solve every problem every year. But, you know, we need a goalie this year. He went out and got us a goalie this year. You know, a couple of years ago, we needed some big forwards. He went out and got us some good forwards. Like, I, I don't... I want somebody to point to something Tree has done or not done, not from a rumor, not from maybe we heard this trade happen. Point to something that Tree's done that's been detrimental to this team. Like, and even like things like this James Neal contract, which well, didn't turn out. He was the Brower? Well, he, at the time, Neal was one of the better goal scorers in the NHL. Mm -hmm. it played rather effectively the year before. Uh, help Vegas go to the Stanley Cup Finals, and Brower was the same. He, he was the top goal scorer or on the free agent market. He was the best player on the free agent market. We got him. Yep. Like that should have worked. He should have been a twenty-five, thirty goal guy. It's not Treleving's fault that his talent just evaporated as soon as he came north of the border. And then when he didn't work out, we moved him. Yeah, we found a way to get out from the problem. Yeah, and Lucic is even though like he's a third line guy, he's one of the better third line guys, and he's been one of the Flames' best players this season. And I think that there's a lot that me from the time I've spent with the team after the games in the dressing room and what we've seen and what we've heard, Milan brings some intangibles we don't see on the ice in terms of leadership and things to this team. And I think that while you can't necessarily value those as five million, I think that there are some things Milan brings that we don't see that make him even more valuable. Well, like if Lucic was getting three and a half instead of five and a quarter, I'd be perfectly fine with that. If he was making uh, Ryan money, he, I think he'd be a good value for this team. Yeah, like that would be perfect value. And even three and a half, four mi million, it would be a little much, but it would be understandable because of the intangibles. He's getting a, a more than that, but that's not our fault. <laughs> but, you know, the Flames made the best... You know, I'd much rather have a player that's really worth about three and a half million and contributing at that level... Than a guy who's not playing at an NHL level 
which James Neal isn't. And we have to remember that, I mean, as much as Lucic on paper is making five five million two hundred fifty thousand, I think what a million of that's retained by Edmonton. Uh, he was actually six and a half, so a million and a quarter is okay. actually. So yeah, six and a half is is too much. But five th- five million. I mean, when you look at the Neal contract, it was roughly the same. We got the better yeah. deal there. So show me something the GM has done that's been detrimental here. I think this is the best GM we've had. I think this GM oh, yeah. has made the best moves. I think he's made the most bold moves, and he's not afraid to to undo his own move. When Brower didn't work out, he he bought him out. When Neil didn't work out, he traded him. Like he's not afraid to say, "I made a mistake. Let's go in a different direction." And how many GMs would not do that? Yeah, like he doesn't have an ego. Yeah, he. Had, you know, you he see them sign ego. a big player, and they don't want to say no, and they put the guy on the third line, and they just let him rot away because uh, you know Bobby he, Ryan, he was their signing. for example. You know, Ottawa got him in trade, and yeah, they just basically let him rot until they finally bought him out. And like you said, I mean, we can we can always look back at anything with hindsight being twenty twenty. Brower, Neil, they were the best guys in the market. Like, how many times has Tree gone out and got the best guy in the market and got them at affordable prices? I mean, you know, Pietro said, look at Johnny's contract. You're right. And that's one of the reasons I think that he's even more valuable. He's playing great, and he's got a good deal. Like, if you would have told me at the time, you know, Johnny's going to be making six seventy five. We got, you know, Elias Lindholm making less than 5 We got... Hannafin and Anderson both making less than five. Like this GM is a wizard at getting guys to leave money on the table, and I don't know how he does it. Yeah, and frankly, like uh, another problem that the defense corps had uh, last year was a lack of size and intensity. And you took out half of the defense corps, uh, well, all but Hannafin and Giordano. Really, you brought Anderson up in the lineup you replaced uh hamnick with Tan- tanev valimaki and nesterov have come in on the third pairing each one of those alterations has been a marked improvement on the team and sure. you know so like even something like the flames had a good defense core on paper and even then the flames Joe living has managed to improve it so it's like whenever there is an actual issue things should be fixed and are actually addressed it's just for whatever reason like there are plenty of excuses that like oh we're adjusting to a new coach or like the racism incident last year or this or that or insert miscellaneous bs here but you know like we're five years into this core and it's the same thing and six years now and you know at some point you have to start holding the actual players accountable and i agree with you and i think like you said we're five years in with this core and this core is not working and yes i mean goudreau's having a great season this season when i look at these guys and their whole body of work for the flames i would say you know if i'm going to look at the body of work for let's say the lineup that we have right now for forwards, Kachuk you keep. Backlund's body of work says he probably deserves to be here. He's a little expensive to be a third line center, and I think you might see him moved at some point because of that. But his body of work says keep him. Yeah, Mangiapane's body of work says keep him. Goudreau's having a good year, but overall he's been terribly inconsistent, and he often doesn't look like he wants to be here. And I think if you can move him for Sun, you move him. Yeah. Well, even, like, going down the list, like, Lindholm looks like he cares and wants to be here. And always has. Yeah. And Dubé is passionate about the team. You can tell just Mm -hmm. based on how he plays. Lucic wants to be here. We can't get rid of Lucic and we wanted to. I think that that it's a little easier now that he's actually playing good. Like, if the Flames wanted to retain $2 million, they could probably get him. I would say, you know... Bennett's looked good this year, but historically, I mean, he takes lots of bad penalties. He's, you know, he's he's a bit of a danger. Yeah, Bennett has actually been a good player this year. I, I just, for some reason, like, he, he was put with the good, uh, Gaudreau and Monaghan line, and he looked better there than the alternative players, but injuries, injuries forced him back down. And again, I think, just like with Goudreau, 
He looks good. Sell high. I mean, you don't go, oh, well, he's there. He looks good. Keep him. He hasn't looked good as a flame. He's taking a lot of dumb penalties. Sell high on him. Yeah. And it's sort of like losing Jankowski and Reeder last year. Like, they were both very effective as penalty killers and this and that and whatever. And they were effective at various points. Have the Flames really missed either of them? Not really. No. And I think that, like, if you're trading like for like, because, like, really, you're not going to just trade Bennett for some, like, a fourth-round pick or something like that. Like, you're going to get a player in return. Uh, Think of, like, the Josh Anderson for Max Domi type trade, like, where you're getting a similar-ish guy in return. Like, you know, like that... You would be making an improvement just by having somebody else, I think. And Well, I think, you, yeah, you'd be making an improvement just by keeping that new guy out of the box as much as Bennett's in there. Well, even, uh, like, that's the thing. Like, if you're getting, like, trading uh, Goudreau, right? Like, uh, I'm always envision the Flyers just because that both makes sense for them and us. Uh, and Goudreau, because he's from there. Uh, but, um... Like, you look at, uh, like, say, like, a Travis Konechny and, say, like, a Sh- Shane Goss bear as, like, the main components in that trade. Like, those would, you know, Konechny would easily be a, on the second line, and he'd probably be a 50-60 point guy, and Goss bear would probably be on somewhere in the lineup like who knows how the- i think we have enough other talent that by committee and whoever we bring in for goudreau like you said we're not getting nothing you'd easily make up the points yeah and like you'd be relying on guys like manjapane and dube to take more responsibility and so you'd see their points go up and it's time to step up show us you can do it yeah, and like everybody, like Kachuk would instantly be the number one left winger. So his points would naturally go up, and so on and so forth. And I think that, like, with, you know, like, at this point, because of how the Flames are playing, it's one of those situations where you have to be focused more on the overall success on the front of the jersey and not really care who's on the back of the jersey. And. You know, like, back, hearkening back to what I was saying earlier about the 08-09 season, uh, and my rant then, it was, like, the, the, there's something wrong in the dressing room, and, like, the Flames should have looked at, like, moving guys like Fanuf or Regeer or Lanko or Ginla, just because there seemed to be something off in the room. And, you know, like, if the Flames had decided to rebuild around then they could have gotten more for those parts than you know <laughs> what the flames basically they gave all four of those guys away and well lanko i think just retired for, due to injury but um like the other three guys like the flames got matt stajan and woo that was about it <laughs> and right. yep you know like they uh, they have a history of selling their key assets too late yeah, and like that really hampered this organization for a number of years just because of the fact that they waited and waited and waited and just gave people away. And, you know, and it's not like those players were not valuable at any point during that. Like, Regeer went on to win the Stanley Cup in LA, and Phaneuf was paid like $7 million a season with Toronto in that. Like, he was still a good player for a long time afterwards. And, like, I think that, like, what this or iteration is going through is that, like, the one lesson to be learned is if the Flames keep guys like Goudreau because, oh, they put butts in the seat, well, th- that's great, but you're not actually going to win anything. And I don't think this organization's ever going to have a hard time putting butts in seats. This isn't Florida. This isn't no. some of those markets. People will come out. I mean, we almost sold the dome during the 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 young guns years. Like putting butts in the seats in this in this market is not an issue. 
No, and, like, especially, like, the Flames out, like, even if they gave away Gaudreau and Monaghan for prospects and not, like, immediate impact players, and the Flames went into, like, a mini retool where they're missing the playoffs for a couple years, like, the fans would still be excited by guys like Kachuk and uh, Lindholm and all the kids coming up. So, like, there's enough there regardless, and I think that... You know, like, this team just needs to figure out what it it wants its identity to be. And based off of, like, drafting for the last, like, four or five years, it's that intense Matthew Kachuk type, generally, is who they've been drafting. And, you know, or guys that are willing to play that style of game, even if they're short, like Manjapane or Dubé. And... You know, like, Valimaki has an intensity to him. Anderson has an intensity to him. Other, let's let's you, talk about that idea of what's the identity here. And I think this is something that's been thrown around this year, this week, too. Tampa Bay, if we look at the top teams, highly skilled. Colorado, fast and skilled. Washington, heavy and skilled. St. Louis, heavy. Dallas, heavy. Vegas, fast and checking. And even in the past, I mean, you talk a lot about the Blackhawks in their glory days with Kane and and Taves, very highly skilled team. Yeah, you remember the, he- and the they heavy were t- LA Kings. Yeah, well, even Chicago, like they had guys that were heavy. They had Brower, um, but they were known as a highly skilled yeah. team. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, Bufflin and like a whole bunch of guys that were Adam Burrish and like they they had a lot of physically intense guys as well. L.A. very much the same. Like they'll fight you in the street. <laughs> type guys and like they did have some finesse guys like Marion Gabrick one year they, he, well, every team's going to have a little bit of everything but when you look at the overall identity of the teams you know I mean that Chicago team was not yeah they had a few heavy guys but they were they were seen as a highly skilled team and those yeah. heavy guys contributed to that you yeah. know moving the puck exactly. getting it out of the corners that was the overall makeup and if we look at the flames I mean let me go through these these pieces with you are they fast uh, well, the only not what they should be on paper, but what the, we're the seeing only, are they fast? The, the only two players that I would characterize as fast on this team are Andrew Mangiapane and Johnny Goudreau. So as a team, they're not fast. No, they they're slow on the forecheck. They're slow on the back check. They're slow on puck pursuits. They don't have a lot of breakaway speed. No. Minus those two guys. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to what else. Maybe they are. Are they heavy? Uh, no. Um. On defense, that has been addressed. That was one of the areas of concern I had is that they had too many guys that were like your average NHL or like six foot one, two hundred pounds, and like nobody actually just physically taller than that really. And now like they have Tanev and Han- Hannafin and Anderson and uh, well not Anderson. Um, well he's more on the heavy side. He's only six one, but he's like two twenty. But and, he plays heavy. Yeah, and Valimaki, who's six five, like the, they've got vertical height now. So like that has been addressed. But yeah, I don't think we need to look at heavy as actual. You know, what weight class are they in? But are they playing a heavy hockey game? Yeah, and they throwing the uh, weight around, or they making it difficult to defend them? Uh, you know, they have bigger bodies on the cycle, all those kind of things. Yeah, and up front, basically the only guys who play a heavy game are uh, the. Dubé, Mangiapane, Kachuk, Lindholm, and Lucic, and sometimes Sam Bennett when he's in the mood. And you were mentioning some D guys there, and I just want to go back to one name you didn't mention, and a guy that you mentioned earlier, or didn't mention earlier on your list of guys that are playing well. I think number five is underlooked this year. I don't think that it's his best year by any stretch, but it, looking at his age, I think we're getting exactly what we expect him to be producing. I don't think that he's one of the guys without heart. I just think that we're expecting something different from him um, as fans. Uh, um... um <laughs> I don't think I'm he should gonna, be necessarily I'm on the top gonna, line. I'm going to disagree with you about um, the heart aspect. Uh, honestly, how would you say? I think that he is not as vocal as he would need to be, and he doesn't... So he let's, he let's reminds take, me... Let's take the C off of him. Uh, he reminds me a lot of uh, post-05 lockout Aginla, where 
very skilled, very talented, but not doing the right things that are actually necessary to help win, necessarily. And I just find that, like, with his leadership style, he's not a passionate person. Like, in terms of being vocal and engaging and, like, talking to his teammates. Like, he... So let's, on, let's on, the the ice, on the ice... Let's take the captaincy away and let's look at on ice number five. Yeah, like, on ice, he does sacrifice the body and he is playing a- adequately for what he should be based on age and all the other factors. I, like, I don't really have any problem with how he's playing. It's just more the personality and like I'm feeling that he might be one of the issue people um but are we are we asking too much or are we expecting more from just because he has a C and is the quick problem or is the quick solution just change who the captain is whether this year or next year like if we take the C off him I think he's an adequate defenseman and I think as a second pair third pair veteran guy I would keep him around for that, but I think maybe it's time to take the C off of him. Yeah, and frankly, you know, um, with... Honestly, I think that it might be getting to the point where it might be time to just move on and cycle out. It's uh, like with what you've been talking about with Gaudreau and that. I think that, like, we've been too focused like it like how we had tj brody forever you think maybe it's just time to move him out because he's been here a while yeah like uh, i think that i part of the problem is is that well like you look at um giordano really he was the only guy who was a legitimate nhl player through the back half of a ginless tenure here and he grew up in in the NHL in that type of a room. And basically, like, how the Flames are playing now is basically how the Flames played from the 0506 season forward. And, like, there's not really much of a difference. Like, they're still better than on paper than they are on the ice. And the same core issues of you know the inconsistency and the not but what if you change not... the, what if you change the leadership to be like you move a couple guys up but you change the leadership to be not that part of the core but i don't think we need to get rid of those guys no. just because they were not part of the core but you just need to cycle leadership through yeah well i that's why i think that like um how like the flames this past season moved brody moved on from brody and brought anderson up i think just the changing of the guard, I think, is what the, the next step in order to fix help fix these problems. I, I wouldn't disagree with moving him just because you know he was part of that core. If we need to move it out, but I just I don't think he's a problem this year. No, I think a lot uh, of people are... and on, on ice, yeah, he's perfectly fine. And it, it in the similar vein of what you were describing with Goudreau, he's playing well. You can sell that. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, and you can get a, a first plus, plus plus, for Mark Giordano. He's not fairly getting, cap efficient. He, he's not getting paid too much. He doesn't have a huge amount of term left. So, like, you can get a couple of really good quality assets for him if you decide to trade him, whether that's getting young-ish NHLers or just for prospects. One way or the other, like you're, you can get a lot of value for Giordano if you were to go that route. And I don't know, I don't know, you're going to get as much from him as you think, but I can see him being potentially dangled to Seattle if they just want to get out from under the money. Yeah. Um. Well, defensemen, especially good defensemen with leadership, you know. Um, but if we're saying he's not a leader, it's one of those things. He has experience, so it. I think it's, next year you could get some for him because on his last year. But I think if you try to yeah. move him this year, I don't know that you're going to get the same value looking at him on a two-year deal as you would yeah, as a one-year rental. Um, that's why I think they might just dangle him Seattle and be out from under the contract. That's a possibility too. And as you were mentioning with uh, chain, you know, the C, 
if it was me being the coach, um, number 19, here's your C. You know. I think of the current roster, yes, but I don't want to say that until I see what it looks like if we make some of those deals. Because I think you might bring in somebody else who might be in that leadership position as well. Well, like also to be as in a rebuke to the you know the the people that were criticizing Kachuk for being Kachuk. I think that you know because the Flames seem to be building an actual identity towards the Kachuk-ish type players from management down giving him the captaincy would be saying this is our team you don't like it go away yeah I can see that well let's go back to that Kachuk identity you were talking about because we're talking about the identity I got a sidetracked so we said fast no heavy not really skilled uh the Flames like when they're down, right, and the, how they play in the third period when they're trying to come back, shows you that they're an exceptionally talented team and are one of the best teams in the NHL. It's the lack of drive to actually have any consistency with that that's the problem. But, but I think that's part of skill. Skill is knowing how to play your game for sixty minutes. Yeah, I well, think there's a difference between skill and talent. I think they're a talented team, but I'm not sure they're a skilled team. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, and I think that the main component lacking from there is lack of heart, really. But that's part, I think, to me, that's part of your skill as an NHL player, is being ready to go for 60 minutes, knowing how to work out of a funk, all those things that we're not seeing. Mm-hmm. Talented? Sure. Skilled? Mm, mm. Sometimes. Yeah. Hard working? Yeah. Right. Maybe at the yeah. Xbox, I don't know, but not uh, on the ice. Yeah, hard working. Um, yeah, they they show up an hour late every game practically, and oh, we have to actually do something. Oh, good, and then they try for twenty to forty minutes, and yeah, let the chips fall. Some yes, uh, half the team. But you wouldn't yes. look at this roster as a whole and say yes. Half the roster, yes. Half the roster, no. I think we want to be a checking team. Yeah. And the, the, that's where, like, sending signals that, like, this is what our team is going to be, I think is one of the next steps that needs to happen. Because, the like, you just look at the Flames players that they've drafted lately in the top rounds. Like, they're all physical banger types. Like, you know, that can score and be effective. But they're basically the Kachuk clones. And, you know, that genre of guy. So, you know, like it or not, that's where we're going. So, um, you know, that's like what the Flames need to add on to. Because it's perfectly fine. And successful teams do play like that. So it's not a bad thing. It's just that this team needs to actually commit to it and, you know, rip off the bandage of you know, maybe taking a step back. You know, like if they say trade Gaudreau and Monaghan for some lesser players, but that fit that identity better. Yeah, well, looking the, at what we have now, I think we know where we want the identity to be, and so is the so is Tre Living, but we're not getting it. Yeah, well, I think that's the next thing that's needed to be looked at. And like, frankly, if it was me, I would be asking uh, the Buffalo Sabers what they want for Jack Eichel. So let's talk about that. So if you're the GM, you're sitting in your office, you're eating your Boston pizza, you're trying to figure out what to do with this team, are you making a big move midseason? Are you waiting to see how this one plays out and making your moves in the offseason? Are you making some sort of move just to make a move? What do you do right now? Uh, um, well, it's one of those where in terms of acquisition price and like what, you know, like if you're – Like, straight selling. Like, say, like, you're wanting to move Goudreau for prospects and draft picks. Best time to do it, trade deadline. So you're the GM. Are you selling? Um, a little bit of both. Uh, I think that, you know, the Flames have a menu of players and options available. And because of the set goal of, like, having the team in that more intense Kachuk mold players that don't fit that become available 
just as an abstract thought process. And then you start inquiring what teams are available and who you might actually be able to make trades with. And because of the whole COVID thing, it probably won't happen during this season. So so it's February 21st now. You're true living. The trade deadline is uh, April 12th. And April 12th is two weeks from the end of the season. So if you trade a guy out, the other team's not going to get a lot of value. Right now, looking at this team in on the 12th, do you wait for the deadline? Do you just no. hope it fix um, itself? No. Like, what I would... Starting today, what I would be doing is starting the process, if it's not already underway, of calling all of the teams and seeing what they have available organizationally, what their untouchables are, what might be available, and the maybe if it makes sense. And start compiling that list of everybody from everywhere. Call, 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 call. And... If you can start seeing, oh, well, these two or three guys might be interesting, maybe then start building towards a deal. And any point between now and, say, the middle of March, if you can get a deal done, great. At that point, I think that uh, the calculus comes a little less. And, like, if you're at that point, you're just adding or on the fringes. Like, you're. So you're not making a move right now just to make a move. You're. Waiting for the the hockey move to come up. Yeah, it, it's sort of like Joe Sackick and how he got criticized for oh well Matt Duchesne wants out, and Matt Duchesne wants out, and oh geez Sackick's really doing a dumb thing because he's old, you know he's not rushing to make a deal. Well, he waited and he waited until he got the right deal, and damn he won that deal hands down. So you know I think that like if the Flames are gonna go that route, that's fine. But do it right, and I think yeah, that... Yeah, I, I just worry that there's going to be some haste to making a move to make a move, and it, we're going to regret no, it later. No, and honestly, Treliving is a very patient person, and I think he realizes that like the important thing is making the right deal, period. And who cares about timeline? So in the meantime, then, I mean, it's February 21st. Our trade deadline's April 21st, so about two months from now. Are you just hoping this thing sorts itself out? Well, or uh, I guess are you willing to? Let's just put it this way: you're willing to sacrifice the season if it doesn't. Yeah, sure. Why not? You know, like if they can't pull their head out of their rear ends by themselves, like you know, it, it's going to put the writing on the wall of well, yeah, th- this is going to change, <laughs> and you know, expect changes. Not you know, maybe there will be changes. Y- you know, pack your stuff. <laughs> And I think if Tree wants to make a decision, or if I was in the GM spot and I wanted to make that decision that we just need to move a guy out, there's rumors that Nashville wants to move Forsberg. I might do something like a uh, Goudreau for Forsberg and something just to make a move with a yeah. comparable type yeah. player. Perfect. Just to move and then kick the ball down the road and figure out what to do after that. Yeah. And you see, the thing, the hardest thing for any GM to do is accumulate enough talent in order to be able to build a contending team. And it takes a while. And Treliving has done an expert job of accumulating as much talent as possible. And, like, the Flames are an extremely talented team. It's just that the parts aren't working together. So now that we have all these talented parts, now it's about getting the right fits. And even if it's not a perfect situation... You know, it, now it's time to s- start shuffling the deck chairs a bit. And, like, the Flames right now, like, they remind me of, like, the mid-80s Flames, where they had a collection of really good guys, but it just wasn't quite clicking. And I think that as we keep moving forward, that, you know, like, we'll start to see a few more trades that will... You know, and like getting a guy like Markstrom for six years, we don't have to worry about the goaltending for a long time. And the defense, half of them are under the age of 24. So, again, don't have to worry about that for a long time. So, it's now it's about figuring Turning out. Turning the, the 12 guys at forward. Yeah, and the rest of the defense core as well. And like Tanev's, they're going to be there for a while too. So, you know, like. 
now it's about finding the the right fits for each of the spots and you know if that requires stepping back for a bit in terms of overall skill up front and going into like a partial rebuild the the best part is is that every year you get a first round draft pick and you know if the flames suck for a bit it, you know like it, yeah it's disappointing but it, it like you look at that one year after the 1415 season the flames were awful but they got Matthew Kachuk out of the deal and the scouting staff is excellent so like i have an 100% confidence with the scouting staff that like if the flames are picking say 11th or 12th overall they're going to get a damn good player out of it. So you mentioned this, you know, partial real build a lot, but let's go back to this season because I think that's what we got to figure out yeah. now on the 21st. You're, you've already said you're not going to trade at least midseason everything that's not bolted down. So you're not doing that rebuild now. You're probably looking no, at that if you're going to do it in the offseason. Uh, unless, like, you make your calls, and if there is a trade that actually can make sense and work... Of course, but we then, don't need to say that, right? If, yeah. if a good deal comes, the GM's smart enough to make it. Yeah, but, but that... Uh, other than do that... You, do, you, do you fire Jeff Ward just to make a statement? No. Do you uh, fire Jeff Ward just to bring in another coach because this one's not effective? Uh, honestly, I think that... I Like, I don't agree with a lot of Jeff Ward's decisions, but he's doing an adequate job. He's not doing anything particularly bad, and in a lot of ways, some of the systems are actually quite interesting and are quite effective. You know, it the Flames have not, as players, have not really had any accountability because I don't think we can really judge Jeff Ward's systems until we see them executed properly, and that's part of the problem. Like they they just haven't got their head out of their posterior yet and you know it's one of those things that if the flames can like if you fire ward you know like that's the easy thing to do but what, who, who do you bring in well that's the thing like you know if the ownership's not willing to spend then you're just going to get insert you know Jeff Ward type guy again like you look at the four coaches the last four Bob Hartley wasn't in the NHL for a long time and like eight nine years so he was just looking to get back in the NHL and so he took a lesser contract because of that then you you have Glenn Gulletson a second time coach who was not very effective and very cheap then you have Bill Peters, again, a second-time head coach. Again, fairly cheap. Then you have Jeff Ward, a first-time coach. So, and the, the, even before, you had Brent Sutter and uh, Mike Keenan, who hadn't coached in a number of years, and Jim Playfair. Like, the last legit coach that they hired was Daryl Sutter. And Yeah, I, I don't think that, like you said, hiring Ward, you don't bring in Gallant. Like, you're going to end up with someone like Dave Haskell. Yeah, exactly. Or uh, Ryan Huska. Where's Mike Yo these days? Like he seems like a perfect kind of used to be now Flames coach type guy. Yeah, like just insert random. Oh, that guy's coaching now. I guess. Woo. And and I think too, if if I let's just say I am a big coach and I'm looking at the Flames and let's say I'm Gallant or whatever name you want to use. Calgary has a history of underperforming. Do I want to go there? Or do I want to try my hand at Seattle or something else like that? Like, I, I don't know that yeah. if I'm Gerard Gallant, Calgary's the top of my list. No, and um, and again, that takes two to tango. And like Calgary is a weird team in that they are very talented, but they're just not clicking and. You know, it would depend. But also, on... history doesn't tell me I'm going to be here for a while. So why do I want to come in? Yeah, and like that's where like uh, the ownership needs to, like that's one of the things that like with that whole thing with the coaching staff that doesn't make any sense to me. That like you're spending like eighty million dollars on a team, and then you can't spend like four or five on a really good coach, and instead are going in the bargain basement like one million dollar guys. 
Like it, but it, let's just assume you know. that they were willing to spend for the coach. I don't think if I'm a top coach, I come here with the Flames coaching record right now. Um, if the coach wanted a challenge, I think they would. Um, like you'd rather take on the Flames than the Kraken for a challenge. Well, uh, how would you say? I don't think that the Kraken will be anywhere near as good as Vegas was. Uh, no, I don't think so. But that's why if you want a challenge, I think you go there. Yeah. But I, I think that, uh, yeah, well, the number one guy on my list, of course, is Daryl Sutter. Uh, but So I think that he would be willing just well, let's, because... Sutter is officially retired, so let's take him off the list because he's officially retired. Yeah. So I, I just don't think, I mean, who have we got that's a big name? Gerard Gallant, Daryl Sutter, we'll throw him on there for you. Who else? Ah. Uh. Yeah, like if, uh, if we're talking about firing Lett, the coach, you, you don't Lett, fire the coach without having a, a, a guy lined up. Yeah, I, is Laviolette coaching? <laughs> I think he's still off, but uh, yeah, like there's not really a, a well, Boost Brujo would be, but I yeah, I, I think Brujo's at this point past his prime. I think he would have been the right coach few years ago. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know that he's uh, he's the right guy right now. Yeah. Peter Laviolette's in Washington. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, so we fire the coach, and like you said, we find some other mediocre AHL guy looking for a shot. What, we bring up Kale McLean. Like, is it an upgrade? No. And So, uh, so if you're the GM, you don't fire the coach midseason. No. And I think that it's also imperative that this team actually mature a bit. And I think that, like, they've kind of got their way for a number of years, like, where... Oh, Hartley's being too much of a jerk. Let's fire him. Then let's go with a extremely passive guy in Glenn Galtz. And oh, the team's playing bad because they're not getting any discipline from the coach. So then they go the other route of supreme hard ass. Then oh, the Flames got him fired. The players did um, by getting Alu to come forward with the racism thing. Allegedly getting uh, him to come forward. Let's, yeah. Let's just be careful here. Yeah. Right. He came forward, whether it's provoked or not, we don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, so, but I, I think that I mean, to me, I think changing for better or for worse, we have this coach, and I think that we could go back and argue all those names you read. Were they the best coach of the time? Maybe, maybe not. But I think that. Coaching inconsistency is one of the problems with this team. I think we're bringing in so many coaches so often that I think part of this core doesn't know what they're supposed to be doing or trying to learn new systems. But I think commit to the guy you've got for yeah. better or for worse and and run with it and see what he can do. Yeah. I mean, I would argue when Dan Bilesma became head coach of the Penguins, I wouldn't say he was a top coach. I think a lot of people question that, and he led the team to a cup because he had a great team. Yeah. Oh yeah, I have and, no, I have no doubt that Jeff Ward could do the same. Yeah, and I think that a large part of it is just raw talent. Like, how would you say, like Terry Crisp? I don't view as being like the best coach, but yet the Flames won the Stanley Cup because they were a damn good team. And mm-hmm. you know, the, you look at a lot of teams like uh when st louis won i don't view barube as being the next scotty bowman no and so and so, and i think and i've said this before i think for professional players playing in the best league in the world the coach only has so much impact no yeah and... i would not say that dean evison is one of the top coaches but he's in minnesota like there's guys who maybe aren't top coaches in this league or are coaching here but i i just i i don't think we can point to jeff ward and say this is the problem i don't know that as we mentioned, firing him fixes the problem because who do you bring in? Mm-hmm. Like oh, you know, I know. F- uh, instead of looking at who's unemployed NHL coaches, what dub coach is not co- uh, Tim Hunter? Like who who in the dubs not coaching? Because that's who we'd end up with. Or whose assistant coach would we end up with? Yeah, and it's just a insert miscellaneous guy here. And is the KHL season over? Maybe we snipe a head coach from there. Yeah, and. Like, Calgary, I think, at this point, is just getting to the point where, like, you just need to run with it. And, you know, if the players don't like it, too bad. 
And if Jeff Ward is your guy, for better or for worse, they have to say, this is the guy, right? And sort of like you were saying with Kachuk, whether we like it or not, this is the coach we think is going to do what we need him to do. So, you know, get on board or get out. Yeah. I, I don't think that the coach getting rid of it, I don't think that moving on from the coach fixed this. I don't think that making a bunch of midseason moves fixed this if I'm the GM. I, like you, am looking at what I can get. I might make a move or two to just change people with a similar value, like a Goudreau for Forsberg or something like that, um, just to kick the ball down the road. But I really think at this point, I mean, we're in we're you know in February 21st and the deadline is April 21st, and I don't think that with the deadline two weeks from the end of the season, the deadline is going to be as impactful as it usually is because if you trade outside your division, the guy's out until playoffs. I think you're stuck with what you got. Yep. And I think that we almost have to either play our way out of this mess or, you know, die trying. And and I think that, you know, you've talked about a rebuild, and I don't want to go that far yet, but I think that maybe missing the playoffs for a year is the kick in the pants this team needs. And, you know, we seem to make it, not make it, make it, not make it, make it, not make it. But I think that – and I'm even getting the sense from management when I listen to Tree this week talk and, and you know, the coaches talk and the interview Tree did on Fan 960 – I think they finally had it. And I think that if we make the playoffs, we might keep guys here just because, like we were talking about earlier, oh, Goudreau's having a good year. Let's keep him around for one more. I think maybe make, missing the playoffs is what we need to finally realize change has to be made. Yeah, and I think that, well, even to this point in the season, like I think that um, other than like the loyalty to an idea of... Um, like the uh, overall makeup of like you're wanting say Kachuk essence to be your general direction that you're going then you know like your loyalty is to that identity not um, necessarily the specific players anymore I think and I think I agree with you and I think it's about saying not just putting the most talented players in the ice like you were saying but who are the players that fit this mold and if you have to quote unquote trade down to give players to fit your identity maybe that's what you have to do yeah and it's not the worst thing to happen if um you know the Flames miss the playoffs like there are a number of I mean you're not going to trade Johnny Goudreau for Kenny Agostino no like you're gonna get high quality players you're going to get a guy like a Konechny or a Forsberg or 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 you know yeah. uh, like you're gonna get a good second line player at a minimum uh, plus prospects if it's only a second line guy so like and I mean let's let's be realistic here Johnny's the top pl- scorer on our team if we don't go to the playoffs does it matter no does it matter who the top scorer is if it's for not well, it's like who was the top scorer on the Detroit Red Wings last year? Who cares? You know, well, like Mantha, the, the but, octopus. Yeah, I don't know. It, it doesn't matter. I think it was Mantha, but who cares? And even in the end, when you look at a Stanley Cup team, how often do we remember the top scorer? Right? They're often known for the team. Yeah. Well, like you look at the the two years that Penguins won the Cup, like Phil Kessel and Jake Gensel were two of the leading scorers those years. And yeah, they like, had Sydney, but Sydney wasn't doing all the work on his own. Yeah, and it's like, but do you, when you think of Pittsburgh, do you think of those two guys? No, you think of no. Crosby Malkin. And but I also just think of that team with an identity. Sometimes I don't know everyone who's on it, but I remember the identity of the team. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I agree that you know Goudreau, some of these guys are top scorers, but if they're if no one else is pulling their weight, what's the point? Yeah. I agree, and that's why this team, they're going to be having a lot of interesting things happening moving forward, and hopefully, you know, like, it's going to be, how would you say it, it uh, like, back when, uh, during the Kachuk year, uh, draft year, I remember saying, like, there's no real bad outcome, because, like, even if, like, the Flames struggle and miss the playoffs, then that's just more information and like we'll have more information based on okay this is what this team is this is what's needed to fix this problem and oh here's some good prospect insert name of you know and you mentioned that last week and i still think that 
we're at the end of the information gathering phase, and we're now at yeah. the point where we need to act on the information. Yeah, and exactly. And like now we're getting to the point where, okay, well, now we've kind of got this team halfway towards a Kachuk mold for the this organization, so do we keep going with that? And then, okay, well, if so, what changes need to be made? And, you know, like, there are a number of good players in this draft as well, so, like, the Flames will be able to... Right now, though, I honestly don't think that you draft and rebuild your way out of this. I think no. they have the assets to trade your way out of this. Oh, no, but, you know, what I'm trying to get at is, like, that, like, even if the Flames, say, finish in the bottom ten, which is possible if they keep this up, like, they're going to get another good player out of the deal. And I also think that if you're in the bottom 10, there, and we'll talk about this as we get closer, there's a strategy to maybe move that, move down, and get another roster player. Yeah. Exactly. Like, there, there are so many different formulations and different ways that this team can go. So, like, it, it'll be interesting, like, over the next few weeks to, as, like, the season unfolds. Like, the next questions I have is, can this team respond to this 7-1 game and, like, have this uh, uh, chalkboard moment where, you know, as a motivational tool, or are they going to completely wither and die? Or well, let's, look at, let's look at that, shall we? Yep. I mean, we, we've had a rough week, like you said. I mean, we're sitting here talking about the sky's falling and move everybody that's, you know, not number 19. But before we do that, we got four games ahead of us. And I think this week is an interesting test of this team because we play the best and the worst. And I think we know how this week should play out. My question is, are the Flames going to be so much in their head trying too hard that they're going to waste valuable points against Ottawa? Probably. Matt, do you want the good news or the bad news first about the rest of the season? Sure. Good uh, news or bad news Good first? news. Nine of our 38 remaining games are against Ottawa. That's 24%. Nice. That now do you want should the bad be useful. News? That should be useful. 21 of our additional games are against Toronto, Montreal, or Edmonton. 55%. Yay. <laughs> and this week, it's split half and half. So let's take a look at this. Tomorrow night, Monday night on the 22nd, a 5 p.m. start time. That can't probably be over before you listen to this episode. Uh, Calgary is in Toronto playing the Maple Leafs. And then again on Wednesday, the 27th at 5 p.m., they're in Toronto playing the Maple Leafs. Then the next night on a back-to-back, uh, we have the Ottawa Senators 5 p.m. in Ottawa on Thursday and Hockey Night in Canada on Saturday. Actually, I guess Hockey Morning in Canada, 11 a.m. start time in Calgary. We have the Calgary Flames again in Ottawa taking on the Senators. So the best and the worst, how do you break this week down? Uh, I'm going to be ultra pessimistic zero for four you think they're you think a big goose egg yep oh matt i wanted to go the same way but i didn't want to go that way like i didn't want to go that way but my head tells me you're probably right yeah well it's one of those things that because of the fact that they're struggling so so mightily and Toronto is flying high. Admittedly, they got everything. Like their their talent is working, and they're firing at all cylinders. So like I'm expecting a loss for sure. You know, like you have to be on top of your game. I I don't see any scenario where we we get a, a point. point against Toronto. Yeah. Like I mean, uh, the the NHL has a forfeit rule. We might as well just use it. Yeah, like it's getting to the like, if Calgary kind of had their stuff together, I could see them winning a split in that. But with how the current makeup, like, uh, you know, I would not be surprised if a repeat of the similar type of score from Saturday happens. And if these games were swapped, I could maybe see a, a Toronto win. Like, if we played Ottawa first and we could get our, our poop in a group, as they say, during that game, I could see them maybe coming out and playing Toronto hard. But after a 7-1 loss in Edmonton and taking on the best team, I think it's going to be in their heads that they're taking on the best team and they're just going to collapse. Yeah. Well, we'll be getting a real good indication of their mental state fragility like if they can come back and actually give toronto a run for their money 
then I'll be a little bit more optimistic moving forward. It's just, yeah, ifs and buts. And with I think the that's a good nuts, point. I don't so. think we need to get two against Toronto in each game, or even one in each game, to to see those games success. But I think they have to play, you know, a good sixty man hockey game. Yeah. And, like, one of the things that this team really does need to stop doing is missing a period or two of games. Like, you you just... Like, I've never seen a team do that before. Like, even bad teams will have stretches of each period where they're... You know, and, like, on occasion, like, a team will have a bad period... But it's not every single game where, like, they're missing either the first or the second period. And just, like, where did the team go? And so, like, that ha- really does have to stop. Like, it's fine if you're having a bad few shifts in a row. Every team has that. But you can't literally go 20, 30 minutes with... Well, that's it. You gotta eventually kick that funk and get out of it. And we don't. Yeah, and, like, that's where the leadership on the bench without, you know, with nobody yapping... Like, that's why, like, honestly, uh, for me, like, the captain would should be Kachuk, and, like, the first alternate would should be Rasmus Anderson. Because, you know, like, between the two of those guys, they'll be yapping at everybody to get them fired up and going. And, you know, like, that, the team needs more of, like, just chatter on the bench. And, like, you look... Like, any time there's stoppages, like, everybody's just stone-faced on the bench. And, like, that's not helpful. <laughs> I'm going to be a little more optimistic than you. I think we lose both against uh, Toronto. I think we will win the Thursday game against Ottawa, not because we're playing better hockey, because I think Ottawa will just be play worse hockey. Yeah, they're and, just that and then bad. I think we, and I think we lose the 11 a.m. game. Yeah. Yeah, so I think could... Ottawa want to prove that they're better than the Calgary Flames, and they'll come back on that game and beat us. Yeah, I could see that. It's gonna be a rough week. Yeah, and knowing how like I am in the prediction game, the Flames will win all four just to be complete asshole. <laughs> if that happens, Matt, you're gonna have to predict a loss every week from here on out. Like Glad all life. losses, goose eggs for the season. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, you know, we know how how superstitious hockey players are. Maybe us hockey podcasts are going to start becoming just as superstitious. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to do good, but we're going to lose them all. <laughs> That's right. I We're going to lose them all, and they've already booked tea times for all the guys in May. Yep. Yeah. You guys suck. Get traded. Go. <laughs> and, and, and I've already booked tea times for all our guys in the day the Stanley Cup playoffs are gonna, or the Stanley Cup finals are going to happen. We should be good. Yep. So I, I I hope you're right, but just looking at this week and looking at where the team is, it almost feels like it's just going to be a painful week to bleed out, doesn't it? Yeah. But you know, uh, it's going to happen one way or the other. Hopefully, it's not as depressing. But grab grab your favorite uh, beer from a Calgary brewery and sit down and enjoy these games, and uh, we'll see what happens next week. And as always, if you need somebody to talk to or you just have you know some burning questions, you can call us or text us at 587-200-7176. And as I said to Matt before we started listening, we're almost like Fraser Crane, but our, our sign-off is going to be Dan and Matt. We're listening. Yes. <laughs> so give us a call, Facebook, Twitter, whatever you need. If you need your Flames counselors, we're here for you. So does it's that? Be a rough week. So does that mean that uh, Kachuk is uh, in charge of toss salads? You know, because of the hair that he has. Somebody's got to do the scrambled eggs then. If we're doing a, a Fraser oh, yeah. reference, maybe that can be Lucic. Yeah. <laughs> well, Matt. Uh, I think I'm done talking about the Flames this week. I think my blood pressure's high, and and I just I want to get this week over with, and it hasn't even started yet. Yeah. Well, um, on the positive side, in the draft there are a bunch of right wingers. <laughs> well, well, there, there's <laughs> you a know. bunch of right wing free agents too. But let's oh, talk draft when we get there. I know. I'm just being a horse. Because yeah, this week was rough. Um, <laughs> As always. Do you want to sign us out and we can, we can yep. go enjoy a beer and uh, and numb the pain before this week starts? Yep. As always, go Flames, go. <laughs> 
Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.